So, um, I would just say a few words uh, about uh, the title. Uh, the brain is a statistician. And what is the idea? Uh, this is not a neuromaths idea. This, as far as I know, was introduced by von Helmholtz himself in the second half of the 19th century. So von Helmholtz, you know, is one of the founders of modern neuroscience. He was a physicist and uh, he created the notion of um, uh, unconscious inference. Uh, he said that somehow the brain performs statistics all the time to predict what's going on, uh, to better survive in a dangerous world. So now the question is, what is to perform statistics all the time? Even for statisticians, most of the time they think about uh, um, estimating an average or uh, a mean or some parameter. And I remember, oh, I'm not a statistician to tell the truth, I'm a mathematician. So I started learning statistics very late in my life. Uh, it's, diff it's different because uh, I didn't have a course of statistics until I was uh, doing PhD. And uh, so I don't have, uh, it was, it's, uh, I, I'm lucky being a mathematician, not a statistician. <laughs> but uh, then the first time uh, I, I had a, a, a follow lessons on statistics, I was shocked by the fact that they said, let's assume you have a sample produced by independent random variables which are normal. And we know that the average is zero, we don't know the standard deviation. How, how do they know? Uh, how do they know that something has some distribution? So I was very unhappy. As unhappy I, as I was when I, I was 16 years old, 17 years old, I read lots of things in Marxism. It was a very good thing for me uh, that helped me understand the world. But one day, I, I read something written by Stalin. Well, I read all kinds of things. And Stalin starts saying, the law of nature, uh, there are three laws of na nature. I said, how do he know? How does he know that there are three laws, not four and five? So I never accepted this kind of assumption that, well, you have a sample which is independent and Gaussian. Why statisticians like so much? Because it's simpler to work with independent things. So you remember a few days ago, Robert in Brazil made a wonderful talk and he, 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 he told us about a paper by uh, Bresler. And Bresler considered a sample in which the, the configuration are independent. Well, it's difficult to find independent things in real life, but this helps a lot. But the brain is cleverer than this. So what uh, von Helmholtz had in mind was something more sophisticated. To do statistics, you need to have a model. And, and this is something most people um, does not know. You cannot make statistics if you, do, if you don't assume that the sample was produced in a certain way. Um, so to do statistics, you need to have a, a model about the way the sample was produced. If you don't have this, you cannot do statistics. So von Helmholtz was thinking about assigning, first of all, a model to, to what? What is the sample? Well, is the stimuli we receive from external world or one part of the brain receive another part of the brain? And I remember, uh, well, um, Siddhartha Ribeiro, at the beginning of the project, told us the famous history about his first lesson of ski. How say ski? Sky. Ski. And he said, well, I had the lesson in the afternoon, and uh, during the night I made a dream. And in my dream, all my body was performing the action. And then the girl said, ah, Siddhartha. But what he meant? <laughs> Somehow, uh, his, his bod was assigning a model to this complicated sequence of uh, actions. 
And I remember when we start writing the project, uh, uh, so one of the in far inspiration of the project was Siddhartha's conjecture about the fact that the brain reverberates experiences of the day during uh, during uh, random and uh, no energy modern REM, uh, rapid eyes <laughs> movement. REM is a famous thing in, st in physics, in statistical physics, is random energy model. But in this case, it was rapid eyes movement. Um, and then uh, we, 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 there was a joke. So in, during this time, the brain tries several models and makes simulations of them. So that was probably what uh, uh, von Helmholtz had in mind. Nowadays, several very important and famous and powerful people in neuroscience believe that the brain is a statistician. I give you examples. Carl Friston, Bullmore, Volpet, Stanislas Duen. Uh, all these people, uh, in a way or another, use this idea. But most neurobiologists are very surprised. So try, try, try asking one of your colleagues in the lab, do you believe the brain statistician? He will look at you and say, you are a madman. <laughs> so even if this is an idea which is very supported by important people, it's an idea which is not majoritary in, in neurobiology. So, Neuromat uses this as one of our basic conjectures. It's clear we are mathematicians. If you don't believe in this, uh, it will be more difficult our life. So now the question is how to get experimental evidence supporting this. Uh, a few months ago, I was drinking a beer with Maria Luisa and Claudia. And they start saying to my uh, to, to, to Zen, well, we need to, I don't remember what was the topic, but uh, somehow I said, well, learning, motor control is based in learning, and learning is uh, based in statistical model selection. And half an hour later, my leader said, I'm still thinking about uh, what you said. Statistical model selection is equal learning. So, uh, how to, statistical model selection means the following. You have a class of models, you have a sample, and somehow you project your sample, project in a way to say it, in the class of models. And say, ah, this is a model which bet, best fit the sample. So what is the meaning of best fit? Probably you have two things to balance. One of them is that you want to, to give to the sample you received a, a a very high likelihood, or at, in another, well, very high likelihood. But on the other hand, you don't to want to put more parameters, more degrees of freedom than what is required, because otherwise, otherwise you start making a, a model for the noise. You don't want to make a model for the noise. The, 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 the classical situation is the following. Let, let's suppose I have here time and I have here some kind of uh, um, data. And then my points, I, I, I record a few points and they do this. Now, if I ask someone uh, what is the best model for this, the naive answer is, well, we can make a polynomial which do this. This is a polynomial. Something of the type uh, of the type uh, of the type uh, y. Uh, why? This is y. So this is t1. This is y t1. This is t2. This is y, t2, and so on. You can make a model of the type A. OK. 1, 2, 3, 4. A to the power x3, uh, t3, b to the power t2, c to the power t plus d. So I can put a polynomial which fits perfectly well these four points. 
Is this a good idea, Cissa? It's a, it's a very bad idea. You know why? You know why it's a bad idea? Because now uh, Maria Luisa arrives happy and say, girls, I got another data. I missed the data. I was there. It was hidden inside the nest. I didn't get it. The data is here. And it has nothing to do with your line. So this is a very bad model because he, you are making a model for the noise and you are not able to predict. So the question is, what is a good model for this? Well, if uh, someone tells you, look, this should be represented not by one minute, not, not by this, but for something like A, T plus B. That's a, that's a straight line. So the straight lines will be something like, uh, I don't know, this. Now, is this a good idea? Well, now the question is, how do I know that this is a right polynomial and not uh, AT plus BT plus C? Or maybe A33 plus BT2? How do I know what is the degree of the polynomial? And this is statistical model selection. Now, I'm working with a class of uh, all polynomial correlating time and uh, val real values. And the question is, how do I find the best order? And uh, von Helmholtz claims that the brain is able to do this. And this is named statistical model selection. Actually, you see, the problem is to have a balance between the, 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 the good um, adjustment of data and the number of parameters. So in the paper, just to conclude, uh, um, Claudia Vargas, Aline Guillermo, Aline Duarte, Guilherme Ost, Ricardo Feynman and myself wrote uh, on uh, retrieving context tree models from EG data, we give uh, evidence that the brain is able to find a context tree without any instructions. Now, uh, I think this is an important direction of research. And this section here is consecrated, dedicated to this. So we will see several uh, projects going on. Uh, so, and then at the end, we may make a short discussion on it. So maybe then we discuss in the end, and we just switch on to the next talk, which is by Bruno on the goalkeeper game. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, continuing uh, Antonio's question, uh, it's a brain statistician. The Neuromat team built the goalkeeper game. This game can be downloaded in the Windows version and Mac version. You can play online also, but it's an alpha version of the games in this website. You can see that. Uh, it soon has a complete version of this game. So this game is... Uh, it's a game where the player takes the role of the goalkeeper uh, in a penalty match. But the goalkeeper in a penalty match is the statistician. This is the question. So what does a goalkeeper? Uh, he tries to guess which side the kicker will shoot. But how he does that? It's try to identify the kicker strategy. So I will describe now, how can I, I describe the kicker strategies? How can I formalize this question? So let's consider the example. So suppose the kicker strategy is the right, middle, left. It shows the sides in each penalty. Right, middle, left, right, middle, left, so on. In a replacing IID way, it replaces the symbol, the, the side middle to the left with more probability Epsilon. So uh, suppose the right, middle, right, left, so it's not changed the, the direction. Right, left, left. So here he's changed this decision. And another is not changed. So how can I represent this? I can use a tree. Okay. I can use a tree where the leaves represent the 
smaller portion of the past that is relevant to predict the next symbol. So suppose I have here my sample that I wrote before, and I want to know, uh, is the last symbol is M? So if the last kicker is the middle, what's the next? So I have here the, the last, sorry, in the middle. So the next symbol will be, sorry, always left. You can see here, with probability one. If the last symbol is right, how can I, in this case here? So the next symbol can be the middle or can be the left. So can be the middle with probability one minus epsilon. It can be the left with probability epsilon here. Sorry. If the last symbol is left, I don't, it's not possible to predict the next symbol because left is followed by right, it's left is followed by left. So how can I do that? How can I solve this problem? I have to look another step back. So I have to look left and the another symbol is middle, left is another symbol is left, it left is another, the other symbol behind is right to predict. So I have to, to, to do this strategy to find. So this is a context tree model. This is a class introduced by Reasoning. And uh, his paper, his big uh, start is the universal data compression in 1983. So we call this model, this stochastic chain with memory of variable length. Variable length because you have to see a variable length to, to look to the past to predict the next symbol. So, and with this, we, we generate a probabilistic cont contest tree model. So, this is the tree that I find, look at the example before. So here, in the middle, the probability to the next symbol is left with probability epsilon, and middle, one minus epsilon. And here, Left is not sufficient, so I have to look another step back to the past to find the predict another symbol. So in the goalkeeper game, we define this two uh, stochastic chain uh, in a finite alphabet A. So I say the Xn represents the kicker's decision it is to be a stochastic chain with member of variable length compatible with the context tree tau p. It's the strategy of the kicker. And the chain yn represents the sequence of the goal keeper's decision and depends on the past of the two both chain. Depends on the yn, it depends on the xn. So I have to give some assumptions all about this game. So the assumption one, uh, given the past, the decision of the goalkeeper and the kicker are independent. So translate this, the probability of the kicker uh, to, sh to shoot in a, in a side and the goalkeeper uh, defends the, the side, given whole pass is the independent, this probability, given the past. In the second assumption, the decision of the kicker depends only of his own decisions. So if the if you start to defend a lot of balls, the kickers don't look that. Just look for the small portion of the past that is relevant to predict the next symbol, like I explained before. So now I we, we try to interesting to find the goalkeeper strategy because we we put a player to to play this game. So want to know what he's thinking, what strategy he's thinking. So in, in, our, in our job, we define, given the kicker strategy tau p, we define the goalkeeper strategy. Tau p is the strategy of the kicker, is the, the tree. Tau? Tau is the tree. 
Yes, yeah. And uh, P is the probability of each le uh, leaf of this cell. So the goalkeeper decision is going to buy uh, a pair SQ. So S is a function where for every tau I have a capital tau is a set of contest tree indexed by A. And Q is going to be a probability family in A where SW is the goalkeeper contest tree given the kicker use the contest W. So the better example that I explained this is like, so the Go keep it. first try to predict the kicker's tree. So suppose the go keep it predict this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because he, here uh, I put the symbol one zero because it can be uh, right and left. It's just an example. It can be every symbol in this tree. Okay? So, so one, is right and uh, one is right and zero is left. Suppose an example we have two sides in this, this place. So first the goalkeeper predict the kicker strategy is this tree. And for every contest he will predict another tree. So for the contest is zero zero he's predicting yeah, sign a, a, a tree for this contest zero zero here. Suppose this tree is this. For another contest one zero is going to be this tree is uh, just by the roof. And for the last is another contest is going to be another tree here. So, but how can I do? Uh, first of all, uh, you have a let's resume. We have x n y n take values in a square. On xn is a stochastic chain with memory variable f with a probability contest tree tau p. Yn is a chain of decision of the goalkeeper represented by the pair sq. So we define the goalkeeper game like this. So it's going to be this product. So I have to look just from the contest of the the goalkeeper, the kicker tree. It just for the contest given. I have in this contest of this goalkeeper, I have to look at contest of the sample of yn. But how can I identify the strategy of the goalkeeper? Give you a sample. So, so I have a sample of yn and xn. So first, I use only the sample of the yn to estimate the kicker strategy. So I start with uh, last, the maximum admissive contest tree. So I go, I have to test every leaf here, every contest. So I have to test is this probability of A given W is equal of A given BW, WB. I have to compare these two here also. So if the this probability is somehow equal, somehow close, I cut this two leaves. So I test every other. So here, suppose it's not close, it's different, the, this probability, so I leave here. I test the others, so here I erase, and here I erase. Uh, here I don't have not, nothing to do because I test here also. So I have to test now this, suppose I erase. So in this way, I find the kicker tree. So for every contest that I estimate, I'm going to use the sample of yn and try to estimate each tree for the goalkeeper. So I repeat the same steps that I did this. Okay. With this, I prove this, this theorem with the a sample of the a sample of the goalkeeper game is y n x n. So a sample of the kicker use this strategy tau p and the goalkeeper strategy use this SQ. So I estimate uh, tau n and x n use this procedure that I described before with some assumptions here. And 
If the sample is large enough, I obtain the real uh, trees of the kick and go kip. No, I, I just use the the information of this his pass. I don't use the reaction time in this. Yes, just the symbols. It's a uh, first time because if I work with the reaction times, I we did the same job you you described in EG. So I try to describe if he's find the kick strategy of the symbols of use the re reaction time. Sorry. Because the goal keeper wants to do what? The goal keeper wants to do what? Uh, the goal keeper wants to do, try to, to find the kick strategy, the goal keeper. Well, but at that each step, uh, what they're trying to do is to avoid uh, the ball anchoring in the goal. Yeah. So you count how, uh, at each step, you see if the goal keeper succeeded predicting where the ball is going to enter. Maybe people who never saw the goalkeeper game didn't understand, didn't understand what's going on. Maybe mm -hmm. explain what Yeah, because here, uh, the goalkeeper game, uh, so sorry? Sometimes the goalkeeper game, uh, the people didn't find the kicker strategy. He just wants to maximize this defense. So he, he uh, he constructs a strategy for him. So I, I go to run some penalties, but I think my strategy is going to be maximized using my strategy. So I, I try to find what is thinking, what strategy is thinking because he he want he is doing this, is is maximizing his defense. The number of the ball to his stop. His stop. Uh, so we find another tree sometimes use the this information. Another trick is I, I think in my strategy here I go to defend more. So you want to develop a tool to be able to identify the strategy of the person who is playing the game. Yeah. S just in as an example is easy to see. So here here. This is the kicker's tree, okay? But here I have probabilities. So I think the in this tree of the goalkeeper, here is going to be one, it goes to be zero. So it's going to be this tree of the it's not the same tree with probabilities, but it can be the same tree of the leaves, but it's not the same with probabilities. Okay, my, qu my question is, uh, why do you need to estimate the cricket strategy? Uh, it is, this strategy is not given in the game. I mean, in the game, the, the strategy in which the ball is, ju is, uh, is jumped, uh, it, is, it, is, it is unknown? Uh, because here, uh, the, the goalkeepers see both uh, history of the game. He see the kicker pass, he see the home decisions. So he, he use this both decisions to do w w what he's going to see. But I don't know if you understand. No, I, guess, I guess people who never saw the game don't understand what's going on. So mm -hmm. Oh, the, ga the game is, is like that. You is going to be the goalkeeper, okay? So have the history passed of the last decision of the kicker. You can see that. And use this information, you go to, to predict the next jump <coughs> for you. You have a question also? Yeah, it's a question. But in fact, it's uh, implicit. So the one that is, um, uh, 
solving the game doesn't know the rules, correct? The w sorry? The? He doesn't know anything about the uh, how you build the tree. Yeah. Then how you how you now you measure or um, how you measure that uh, this person built somehow implicitly a model and has selected this model. This is based on the reaction times. This is based on exactly what? It's based on the fact that you show. What you have, you, c you have a version of the goalkeeper game with reaction time. But uh, he's not speaking about this because the technique with reaction time is more or less the same idea of what we did with EEG. EEG is more difficult. Now what he's using is just the information about uh, uh, the, the following. Uh, the kicker chooses a direction. The goalkeeper ignores what direction. He must jump simultaneously to the, to the kicker action. And then you see if he predicts well if the ball is going to the left or the right of the center. What you, the goalkeeper wants is to, to stop um, a maximum number of balls. It's impossible to stop all the balls because even if he knows the context tree, the choice is probabilistic. So what he can do in the best possible case is to stop a certain uh, frequency, relative frequency of balls. And what uh, the theorem Bruno proved in his PhD dissertation does is to tell you how the, the, the goalkeeper behaves. So we don't know. So the goalkeeper could do several things. He could imagine that the sequence will be always something, or he could uh, try in a random way, or he could identify. Uh, so we don't know. Actually, nobody knows. And now we have a statistical tool to look at the performance of the goalkeeper and to assign a model for this. And about, uh, yes, his performance will give you an, an information about uh, the strategy he's using. he's using. Which is not, uh, I don't believe he's do, do using the best, best strategy. Thank you, Antonio. S so maybe we, we should switch to the next talk, no? Because. Yes, I will conclude. Hmm? Okay, Bruno, so you conclude and then we. So, see, I, I don't know what strategy the goalkeeper is going to do with this sample. So, with this model, I'm going to, to f assign what is going to think. Every person is going to be an, uh, a different model. So, maybe. maybe, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. But, uh, wait. Sorry? Not the same trick. Every person can be fit. Yeah, it is a fix. But every person can think, uh, can assign a different strategy of the same tree. And the strategy used the algorithm that I described. I, I have the, the sample of the, the kicker. F first, I, I find this, this tree of the kicker. And after, I, I for every leaf of the kicker's tree, I find and the uh, tree of the goalkeeper. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So I'm Cissa. I work with Claudia in uh, at uh, UFRJ. I am a medical student there. And I will be talking a little bit about what Bruno just introduced to us uh, in a um, different way, though. So, <laughs> all right, so what does a goalkeeper do? They protect the goal. Now, how do they protect the goal? They try to predict where the ball is going to go. So. Uh, in this picture, we have several different movements a goalkeeper can uh, make to protect the goal. Now, 
as Bruno was saying, how uh, does he or she choose which movement to make, where to go? And as he was also telling us, uh, we believe that he, based on the past, he's going to make a decision, which is the best direction to move. Am I going to go to the right, to the left, or am I going to stay put in our game? In the game, we have only three options. Um, so how does the game work? Um, let's suppose I am the goalkeeper and I'm playing the game and um, I will have an arrow. So here we have re left, middle and right. So I can choose from these three options. Can I go, I can go left, middle or right. How do I make this choice? Based on my previous tentatives, I tried left, it worked, so I'm going to try left again. Or I tried left or right, and uh, left and right works. And then I'm going to study the previous steps to make a choice for my next step. And um, that's why, uh, Bruno, on, on our first level of the game, we're going to have a det deterministic um, sequence. So that the person who's playing um, has a better chance of learning uh, what steps to make. There's um, little chance the person is not going to preview, pr predict what the next step is going to be. Um, so the objectives of our work uh, at the lab are to measure the event-related response and reaction time and the accuracy. We are going to, um, of individuals who are playing the game. Another objective we have is to retrieve the capacity of the human brain of modeling the context tree, which is what Duarte uh, did in her paper uh, with the rhythms. So um, we retrieved, she retrieved the, the context trees from um, the EEG of people listening to a rhythm, um, a sequence of events. And um, so we're going to try and do that with the game. Now, we're also going to do that. So we're going to do that to healthy individuals and to individuals with brachial plexus injury. Why, um, as you all remember from yesterday, I believe, when you have a brachial brachial plexus injury, you're not, your, your um, motor system doesn't work as properly as an, a healthy individual. You have um, a, a, a breach in uh, the, the communication between your muscle and your commands, your, your brain. Uh, so in here we have a the setup we have at the lab. This is a student of ours who is, uh, has, is wearing a EEG mask and each one of these dots here, they collect information from that region of the brain and then translates into signals as we're seeing here in the y-axis of this um, EEG, um, I forgot how to say this. Recording, thank you. Yeah. So when we're analyzing this data, what do we do? We have the x-axis here, which is our time, and we have our y-axis, which is each, each line here correspond to one of these little dots here on the head of our individual. And when you turn that into paper, you see different signals. And then we can study these signals and correlate to the uh, corresponding time that which the individual responded to uh, the action. So the person chose to go right or left, and so they made the decision at that specific point. And then we can read that from our EEG and uh, compare results from um, several individuals and find patterns, just like we're trying to do with all the modeling here. So what do we expect? We propose a stochastic modeling to explore 
how our brain represents sequential sensory motor structures, which are the context trees that Brun was just telling you about, telling us about very specifically and perfectly. And we believe that there will be differences between patients with brachial plexus injuries and healthy individuals. Because, as I said before and yesterday, people talked about it, you have um, a lesion, right? You have an injury. And we also believe that um, the, the uh, response will be uh, re related to the type of injury they have. So if it is um, the side that they have the injury or the severity of the injury or the extent of the injury, it will probably have a, a correspondent uh, EEG to, uh, to that. It's going to have a, a, bit dif a, a little bit difference. And that's basically it. Can I answer any questions? My question, uh, why do we expect to see differences with people with the lesion? Why do we expect to see differences? I understand that seeing the difference is very interesting, but why do you expect it? Mm. So to solve the problem and to find the statistics behind, not to si uh, not to find to guess. Yes. Um, you 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 have everything for this. You have uh, your eyes, your intact brain, your mind. Yes, but so why why having a lesion? Yeah. Uh, is a problem. Okay. Um, a lesion, I mean. A, lesion. a peripheral one. Very for one concerning the um, arm. Okay. Um, what I believe is the, the answer to your question, Sanjui, is that um, I, as yesterday, Fernanda was telling us about brain plasticity. Once we have um, the input of your information is not the same as before. Um, so, um, as well as the output. Thank you, Claudia. So if you don't have a perfect connection anymore, so the wires are not well connected, uh, whatever information that comes is not going to go through as it did before. So whatever information is going to get to your motor cortex is not going to, it's not going to be all the zeros and all the ones you had before. You're going to be missing a zero here and a one there. And then for your brain to reconstruct what that information is, is, is uh, called plasticity. It's how uh, your brain needs to remodel um, how it works, as well as your peripheral uh, nervous system. But the point here is that the, the information you need for solving the task or for guessing the model is purely visual. Purely visual? Yeah, in the sense, uh, uh, if you, uh, you see the monitor and you now you need to guess if it is in the middle, right or left. Uh -huh. So it's, pu it's pure visual. My, my question to you, do well, you expect... Because we, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, of, of course, I, I, I mean, uh, 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 if you find differences, it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Maybe related to mirror neurons. Yes. May, may, may I, uh, uh, do you see uh, the do you see difference uh, of the left and the right arm, or not? This is possible. Yes. That uh, okay. That this is uh, Maria Luisa will be talking about this very um, very uh, clearly. Um, she has found that there is difference when you have a not only she but there's been work that has proven that there is a difference in your. Uh, uh, predictability once you have a peripheral uh, lesion. It's um, uh, we uh, uh, Ligi also proved that even your balance is is uh, damaged by uh, a, a brachial plexus injury. So uh, we didn't know before that even my standing here is affected by a lesion in my brachial plexus. Right, but it does. It has effect. It does affect my balance once I have an injury in that section. 
But remember that you do not need balance, you do not need arms, you do not need anything to solve the the. the, the You're game. right, but so then. This is what is but I am simulating, yes. Yes, you're yes but. Uh, you're yes. Yes. <laughs> exactly. So and be and be amazed. Yes. Yes. So so uh, yeah. It's a it's a thank you. <laughs> That's it. I don't need to, to say anything else. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. It's a bit what what Sergio said. I mean. W Can you so please it's speak it's louder? It's it's uh, close to what Sergio said. Um, and for me, you're confusing two things, the, the sensory part and the motor part. And why should the motor part follow a context tree? I mean, I, I, on the one hand, you want to see if there's a, an image of a context tree of a stimulus in the brain of a subject. I see. But then... I uh, okay, so from what I understand, your question is, these are two separate systems. Why would it be affected? Is that it? They're not separate systems. It's all connected. We can't simply say uh, the, nerve, the central nervous system is one thing and the peripheral nervous system is another thing. It's all connected. So let's put it that way. At the, at the EEG level, they are not separated. I'm sorry, I can't the, understand. So let's put it that way. At the EEG level, yes. they are not separated. At the EEG level, I'm telling you that I mean you have to account when you deal with data <laughs> again <laughs> when you talk about data when you talk about data you have to think of the precision of the data yes y your example before was I mean, you can say anything you want as long as you d you're not quantifying the precision of the data. It's the same. Uh, EEG is a. I'm not making a claim. Uh, okay, that is, we'll have a discussion. I'm not okay. making a claim. Yeah, we'll have a discussion. That's it. That'll be interesting. Uh, well, um, I believe that uh, Maria Luisa will be able to answer both your questions more precisely, and we, you, we'll probably have more questions after that as well, and I think it's going to be a very productive discussion. But uh, the person there had a, an, a question as well. I wanted to understand how you plan to to use reaction time. So um, and I was thinking, so, so, uh, the the last version I tried of the goalkeeper, uh, you just um, uh, it, it it doesn't matter. It it it's. The reaction time is not important for uh, uh, um, uh, for the performance of the goalkeeper because it it will wait for you to take a decision to uh, to make a decision to 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 score to to kick. You're right. right. So yeah. I mean, so I was thinking for a normal for a regular non lesion person, mm -hmm. uh, the the person would like uh, be more interested. The person uh, uh, playing the game. Doesn't know the, um, uh, the your. I mean, our research interests, and they they don't only know they uh, they need to uh, uh, to get the the best estimate they possibly can, and then if they want to like think and analyze and like right. make mm -hmm. uh, some uh, declarative uh, processing in there, and then and then to make uh, to make a decision, or even they if they're lazy or not motiv motivated and. Um, uh, they, they, they it will increase the reaction time because it's not really important for uh, uh, for the performance. Uh, so uh, I, w I wanted to know. I mean, uh, I, 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 I'm assuming you're expecting um, a lower reaction time in, in a person with a lesion, but I, I don't know. So okay. how do you separate? Uh, okay, I, I do understand what you, where you're coming from. We, we uh, from what I've learned, we're still working on the time, uh, the version with time, right? So there is going to be there are going to be two versions, one with time and one with no time. So yes, you're right. When we're when we're, when we're dealing with no time uh, version, 
then reaction time is is irrelevant. But uh, when we're dealing with the the timed version, where the the person must answer in as fast as the person can, then we're gonna be able to measure that data. But as for now, you're right. We can only measure the response time. Yep. Any more questions? Okay. Yeah. So. Okay, so thank you very much for your talk. Actually, everybody was talking until now about the goalkeeper game. Maybe my talk should be the first one because it was a project developed before the goalkeeper game. The goalkeeper game is much more sophisticated than this experiment I will show you. But it gives a lot of base for what we are thinking about doing now. And today I will present for you uh, some results that we recent, recently um, analyzed with the help of Antonio and Michelle Miranda. Yes, collaborating with us. I help. <laughs> I usually help the people. Sure. Um, we try to, uh, what I will present for you is a cluster approach for EEG analysis. And the prediction in this context is always thinking about the motor system, the motor capability of predicting an event in the future. Um, so, as Antonio said in the beginning, the, the prediction capability is uh, so important for, for to act in the future, for to, to do uh, proper movement as the ideas from Van Helsing uh, stats since a long time ago. Uh, we are still working on this and this seems to be re really important, not only to act but to interact with others, to uh, act in the world with objects and to understand scenes and everything. And as we saw yesterday from uh, our group presentation, we are really interested in working with brachial plexus injury. And one of our uh, questions in, in this work, in this results that we present, are uh, the understanding of, of how this severe uh, peripheral lesion that has as uh, some central implications, do we plasticity? How this uh, affects the capabilities of predicting an upcoming event? And the questions I will try to show you the answer today are, would the sensor motor cortex be able to distinguish between different con prediction contexts? And does the, the brachial plexus injury affect this prediction capability? Um, briefly, I would like to present for you the, the no, not necessary, the experiment we did. We used an action observation paradigm in which the subject watched to a series of video clips presenting three different, three, three possible uh, contexts of prediction. We call these conditions hand move, ball move, and no move. I don't know if the video will play, so I'll only to show you <laughs> how is the, the thing that they, are, they were observing. Okay. No, it's not PDF, but the video is not best. But it's here in the... Um, the yellow ball condition we call hand move, and after 2.5 seconds, uh, a hand, the hand uh, moves and grasps the ball. The subject watched this. The only do thing that the subject should do is to watch, watch it, the, the, the video sequence. In the blue condition, we call it ball movement. After 2.5 seconds, the ball moves toward the hand and touches the hand, always in this region. Yeah, the same region. And in the white condition, white ball condition, 
uh, we have no movement, so I don't need the video. And the, rain, the, the hand and the, the balls remain stationary for, for the same time. Uh, the subject could watch even the right or the left hand, and each condition was presented 60 times for the subjects in separated blocks, div divided blocks. Yes, the, the presentation order was mixed. This is one of the things that the goalkeeper is more sophisticated because they had a structure for the presentation of the stimulus. Our was a random presentation. And this protocol was thought, uh, taken into consideration previous work from Kuhner from and, and collaborators with Claudia, who was a collaborator in this paper. <coughs> in this paper, they show that uh, there is a, some activity in the sensory motor cortex, and negative, it's prior the beginning of the movement here in the black line. That is called um, redness potential. This is all, all, uh, well known from since, since the 60s. And in the <laughs> what? Ah, okay, yeah, the negative is for the higher. And uh, <laughs> sorry. And what this paper showed it act it's conventional in this literature. So, in the what the paper showed is that even the observation of uh, movement made for someone else is accompanied by this negativity in the si in the signal. So. Uh, there was a proposal that the redness potential, considered until then a marker of motor preparation, could be as well a, ma a marker of motor prediction. This was what I did during my doctorate, my PhD thesis, but this is not what I will present today. Um, just I put this just to focus you that uh, all analysis we will present are confine it to this time window corresponding to the negative slope period. There is a period of time of uh, 500 milliseconds prior to the beginning of the movement. In our uh, experimental conditions, this is the time between 2 seconds and 2.5 seconds. All analysis I will present uh, are in this time window. Yes, yes, and also when he see the blue ball, well, well also, yeah. but this is not after that. <laughs> yeah. uh, when he's, yeah, but this is our, these are from, not from my paper, it's from Kuhner's paper, but the, our cur curve is very similar. We, uh, we saw we saw this for not only for the prediction of a movement of someone else, but also for the prediction of the touch of the ball in the hand when there is no movement being done. Is that the ball or someone else. Someone else. Uh, the, the blue condition in the ball. Yes, the, the film is always followed by a, a, a black screen with a fixation point and then the next video. A sequence of 60 videos, then a uh, stop that block. All videos with the right or the left hand, the right and left hand were not mixed, only the conditions were mixed. And then the next, uh, the next block could be the right or the left hand. This was decided by Sofia Chance before the beginning of the, the experiment for that subject. But these are other data. <laughs> Today I'll, uh, I will present this uh, proposal. That is a three steps analysis that are this, this three. First, we run a K-means cluster analysis followed by a Fisher exact test and a multi-subject analysis with Fisher, but with Fisher text. Um, before we prepare data this way, we selected uh, two sets of electrodes, uh, eight over uh, the sensory motor cortex, that uh, is our target, and eight over the hearing head, this is the net uh, configuration, 
and here in, four, in eight electrodes for each side over the temporal cortex that we consider uh, the control electrodes. We also had other controls, but as the time is slow, I will present only the temporal uh, results. Then, for each subject and each electrode, we compute the average signal across epochs, across the segments of, video, of the videos. There's, there's 500 millisecond segments mm, for each experimental condition. Here in red, we see for one subject in particular, the results for each condition in red is the average of the signal of the epochs for this subject. Uh, then we consider 12 average signals obtained from three experimental conditions and for four electrodes over sensor motor cortex and for four electrodes over temporal cortex. Here, uh, just to illustrate for uh, this, the data from, from one subject, we can see that for different conditions, ball move, hand movement, and no movement, we have different functions of the signal, but between the, here is CP4, not CP3, sorry, but between the, electrodes, we have a very similar function for the same condition. This is what we will try to see with the clustering as well. And then these 12 si signals were submitted to the, the key means cluster analysis. The, object, the, the objective of this clustering was to group the 12, the 12 curves into three plus possible clusters that are the conditions in the experiment, uh, no movement, uh, hand movement, and ball movement. The assumption is that the signals from the same condition should belong to the same cluster. And the hypothesis is that we are able to observe this separation between conditions for the electrodes over the sensory motor cortex, but not for the electrodes over the temporal cortex, because this is what we do, we, the sensor motor cortex is doing. It's relevant for the sensor motor cortex. And then after the clustering, we did a Fisher exact test to test the dependence between the condition and the clustering label. Uh, we tested for the null hypothesis that the cluster label is independent of the experimental condition. After this test, we, we did a multi-subject analysis in, it, in which a Fisher test was performed by each subject independently. <coughs> Sorry. And we used a procedure of Benjamin Hockback to, to correct the p-values and to, to control for false positive rates. Uh, I, I forgot to put this earlier. <laughs> We tested two groups of subjects, a group of uh, control participants with no injury or lesion in peripheral nervous system or central or motor system. Of, we tested two, uh, 18 subjects, but only nine were included in the analysis after the pre-processing of the signal. All ma uh, seven males and all right-handed. And we tested nine participants with brachial plexus injury. Uh, only six were included in the experiment, in the analysis, all male, right-handed. And here I put a, a, a description of the, the, the participants. I will not enter in detail, but we can see that the patients, uh, four patients had a right side lesion and two a left. All they were right-handed. And the diagnosis, the Coincidentally, the two that had the left up upper arm injury had a complete lesion that, that, that severed all the, the trunks of the brachial plexus, and the others were mainly compromit, uh, compromised in the upper trunk that compromises the movement of the shoulder and elbow. And just to, to show the uniqueness of its patient, I bring the since the, the, the muscular, the force test, the muscular force test for motor function and the sensory test. So you can see that uh, we have patients with a severe lesion of motor system and of sensory system and other patients that are less severe. The, the, the degree of disability of the patients is very variable and this is a challenge we face 
when working with brachial plexus, and all works in the lab will pass through this. It's we cannot avoid this. It's very very difficult to do to make a group, uh, even with similar lesions. The the disabilities are very different. The results. <laughs> We are still thinking of uh, the best way to present these results, so uh, the, the discussion will help us a lot, I think. Um, first of all, for right-hand observation in the control group, we can see here in the table the comparison between uh, two conditions every time. Ball condition, no, no movement, hand movement and no movement, hand movement and ball movement. And the table indicates the number of subjects that rejected the null hypothesis. This means the number of subjects that were able to separate between the conditions. Yeah, the, the label is independent of the condition. We can see that uh, for control subjects, almost all the individuals were able to separate between conditions. We, when we are looking for right hemisphere um, electrodes or left hemisphere electrodes in the sensorial motor cortex. So it's, they, they do this. And for temporal electrodes, there was no separation between the conditions. So it was a, a, very, a, a very specific task for the sensorial motor cortex. This helps us with the choose of electrodes because we have a lot of electrodes to choose and this shows that the separation works. Uh, for left-hand observation, we had a very similar result for the control subject with, the with the, a good possibility of separation between conditions uh, for sensory motor cortex, but not for the temporal electrodes. And for the patient, we have uh, a few differences. <coughs> we saw that um, for the right-hand observation, all of them were right-handed. We have two of them with left-hand lesion, left upper limb, sorry. And we saw that the comparisons that uh, includes a hand movement in the comparison, the hand move versus no move, and the hand move versus ball move, uh, were somehow still, were for this, these comparisons, the prediction ability was still working. They were still able to differentiate between the conditions. But for the, con the when the, there is the ball movement versus no movement condition, for the hemisphere contra contralateral to the observed hand, they were not capable to differentiate between the conditions. We are one of the hypotheses that the sense we have other data with sensor impairment. And we want one of the hypotheses that the sensory impairment is too is affecting too much the ability of predicting the, the predicted ability of these patients. One of on another, one other possibility we are still thinking is that the the brachial plexus injury and all the plasticity due to it are influencing are are heightening the hemisphere specialization because we know that the right hemisphere uh, is specialized in processing the space around the body. Time. I have to stop. It's only one more slide. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so probably the capacity maintained here in the right hemisphere could be done do with this uh, specialization of the right hemisphere. And for the left-hand observation, we, we found that the, the hand movement condition, uh, the, the, pre the prediction of hand movement condition was impaired. We are, one of the hypotheses is that this is uh, related to the motor dominance of the participants that are all right-handed. And because and also because other uh, experimental data with left hand observation, uh, for example, the redness potential data that I have in my PhD, it's not consistent for left hand observation. Uh, it's very variable. <laughs> but the 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 only prediction, the only condition that was capable of different of differentiating between the conditions. Sorry 
was when there is a ball movement involved in the observation. And again, uh, this could be a, a, a result related to the specialization of the right hemisphere in processing space, that is the hemisphere uh, activated in the in with predominance when they are watching the left hand. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Time for one question because we are very late. Can you go back to, to the slide where you show the raw signals? Uh, there, there just Sorry. Uh, well, the uh, raw uh, signals. Anyway. Well, yeah, but, uh, like, well, okay. Like this? Uh, no, bef uh, before, after that, when you, you show yeah. the signals that you are at, at that one. Okay. I mean, the, the signals are, 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 I mean, oscillations, right? So, uh, if you take the average of two oscillations and they happen to be just slightly uh, out of phase, they cancel instead of reinforcing each other. Mm -hmm. So it's a miracle that you get some signal out of averaging those things because they clearly are not aligned. I mean, they are not in phase. Huh? But no, well, just look at them. I mean, they are not synchronized. <laughs> So, so it's a miracle that they are signalized enough that you can still get a signal out of that. It would probably be better to take something like the power spectrum of the signals and average the power, power spectrum, spectrum because then the power spectrum doesn't depend on shifting, mm -hmm. uh, for instance. Uh, the the yeah, no, but uh, you, you, you. Yeah, well you take take a power spectrum, I mean a spectrogram. Okay, a spectrogram, well if you want. Okay, but uh, but. Uh, yeah, okay, but I mean, say for instance, when you if you if you if you if you ask a subject to speak a vowel, several times, and you, you measure the waveform, it looks like random noise, and if you average those of those, the, yeah, no, it is a miracle that you got <laughs> something out of that. I think you would get a much clearer result. The name of the miracle is statistics. No, it, it is a miracle because you, the, the, the things happen to be just synchronized enough that you got to see them out. Okay. <laughs> just a, it's a second question. Uh, uh, first, a clarification. The, there was no task, just the observation, the visual observation of the hand. Yes. That's right? The only thing that I said is that the they should observe. When you say the co it's color coded. So yes. the patient to know what will happen yes. in this function. Color code. So again, it's a completely visual task. This is very yes. it, it, yeah, it, This is the first thing. So wouldn't, uh, and this was not clear for me, wouldn't you expect to see a uh, clear um, difference between patients with left as compared to the right impairment? Mm, to the impairment of the subjects to the impairment of the subject, because at the end you, you were saying about the dominance of right mm -hmm. and left hand. Although you could not really see it because in your yeah. group, all were right-handed. Yeah. But wouldn't you expect that people that cannot use, so to say, the arm? Mm -hmm. And if this is the case, shouldn't you have a control that doesn't use <coughs> the left and right space, but upper and lower? Uh, this would be uh, a good because control. What I'm missing here is the, is the controls. Mm -hmm. Since uh, you're always um, taking from the visual space, saying to us, I, I, I also for me it's amazing that you see this in the somatosensory motor cortex. Wouldn't we expect also to see in the visual cortex? The yes, visual. we have the visual because cortex. And I, and I think that uh, this idea of testing upper and down, and, uh, and so upper and lower space mm -hmm. is very important because I understand it, that you have. And it, and yeah. uh, actually, the sensory condition, the bowel movement condition, uh, was in the beginning a control condition, but we were not expecting that the redness potential that was our first uh, goal would be present in the the sensory condition, but we saw for the control participants that it was this was present. So 
I, I agree with you that there are some controls that were not provided by this experiment, but um, for now is what we have <laughs> in the data, so. Yeah. 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 We expected to, to do a group of only right hand or only left hand, but yeah, the timing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I think I have to cut this discussion, which is very interesting, but we have we have a talk still, and then Rocky will give a talk, and we have, so, I, no, no, it, it was a very nice talk, so we thank you again, but I, we discuss in the coffee break after. Well, hello. Um, uh, I will start beginning, I will begin. By yeah, I will, I will start by presenting myself. I think it's the best place to start. My name is Fernando. I'm a biologist. I'm ending my, uh, ending my master's degree at, in human physiology with a focus in neurophysiology here at the University of Sao Paulo in the Biomedicine Institute. And uh, here I will present some ideas of experiments to a PhD that I, pretend to, uh, intend to, to start now. Uh, this, uh, the, the ideas of this experiment are based on a first paper that, were, that Galvez already mentioned that was published this year. Uh, here's the title, Retrieving a Context Tree from a EEG Data. From EEG data. And here are some topics that we will touch on the next experiments that I pretend to, to go forward with. So here's the uh, citation of the, the work. And this work starts with uh, this conjecture that we talked before, that the brain does statistical model selection. It does this by assigning probabilistic models to samples of stimuli. So uh, how do they did this experiment? They use the auditory stimuli generated by random sources. These sources were given by, well, a context tree, like the ones Bruno talked before. I uh, will talk uh, briefly about that. I won't go deep, be especially because I only have 10 minutes. And uh, well, if, er if I understand correctly, there are a few people who work di on this project. So correct me if I say something wrong. The idea here is simple. That one, one way you can think about this experiment is starting with a deterministic sequ sequence. So 2, 1, 1, 2, 1, 1, which uh, you, attribu uh, you uh, attribute um, Stimuli to each value, so you can have a strong bit, a weak bit. In this case, you, you create a vault. So, yeah, I'm not the best at clapping, but I think it was. Uh, but at, uh, at a, a prob there is a, prob a probability that instead of giving a an one, you have an a zero. So in the end, you have a uh, uh, two one one two zero one two zero zero two one one two one one two one zero, and therefore, and it goes. That, with that, you can uh, give probabilities to what's going to happen next. So if I have this sequence and I get a two, what's the next? Uh, what will happen next? Well, we know the probabilities. We know that I have 20% chances of a zero and 8% chance of a 1. But if I have a 1, what's going to happen next? Well, I don't know. Actually, I have to look at one step for, uh, behind. So let's say I have a 0 before this 1. I have a 0, 1. Therefore, I know the probability will be a 2 after that, if I really understand the sequence. So uh, each of these combinations, uh, the combinations of steps I have to take to know what the probability of the next step are a context. There's a leaf in the context tree, like Bruno said before. Well, I can present that to someone. And like when I clapped the waltz, you guys could understand the, the sequence that I was presenting. So we can, a conjecture you can give as you, is something in the brain who has the structure of the sequence we presented to you. Therefore, use that, use that to find the, to 
understand what's happening in predicting and say, oh, that's wrong. That zero was supposed to be a one. Uh, there, this experiment used two trees. Uh, ternary is two one one, like I said, and this uh, the quaternary that's a little like a samba, one two one zero one two one zero, and which uh, with probability of stand, stand, instead of a one a zero, a twenty percent chance, and we got the question: Can uh, the structure of the source be found in the EEG data? Well, EEG. As people I talked before, uh, it's a is a record electric activity of the brain measuring the voltage fluctuations on the scalp of the participants, and there's a lot of different techniques to analyze the data that you get. I will talk about uh, the two here. The first one, because I will mention later, is a uh, what we call event-related potentials. There's uh, potentials that you get after you give a, a stimulus to a person given a context or sometimes not. So after I give a um, sound, you get that. You have a lot of variations and you can change the, context, the situation where you give the, the stimuli to see if you find differences. What you, they did here is, uh, is a generalization of that where they compared uh, the context the situ uh, to the, the situation, uh, the leaf, context leaf, to see if the people was correctly identified in the context tree. So if I have a zero one, they, s they saw you have a one. So they look at the record of the one and see if the, different, if the zero one had the same record as a uh, two, one two. Yeah, exactly. So you could compare and try to find uh, if people were correctly identifying the, the source. And what they found? Well, that's really inter interesting. In the uh, ternary tree, which we would expect was really easier to identify, actually they found only three, uh, sorry, I forgot to put it here, there were 17 participants. Uh, they could find only three uh, trees correctly identified in the two. That would be the simplest context, because you are in, always know where I feel got the two. But in the quaternary tree, you actually found a strong uh, presence of the, the, the trees in, this, in the data. 12 out of 17 participants correctly identify, at least in the, the more common context leaves, the, the, the context, you could find the context in the data. It is really interesting. First, because you can ask uh, what's, why you have this difference, but I will focus, focus in a little in a lot uh, on other things. Uh, the first question you get, yes, is well, we get 12 of 17 people in the quaternary tree. Even the best result could even be better. Why? Well, the hypothesis is the sampling size. If you have a bigger sampling size, well, you're going to find a uh, stronger, uh, more robust finding in the EG. Equ Why don't you have it? Well, we always would want the biggest sample size we can, I imagine. Unless you have a too much time, you don't have too much time to analyze the, the data later, but you always go to the highest number you can. But EEG is harder, is not that easy to collect. There's methodological problems. Uh, not only you have to, you can use a certain practice in your hair, you can have certain types of hair, someone with dreads, it's hard to use, a, a, they put electro electrodes in the, someone with dreads. So, but the biggest problem you can find is, the, well, I sometimes in the literature cause stimulus hunger. If you give someone the same stimuli over and over and over, nothing else, people are starting to get some certain reactions. Is they usually get sleepy. If you make people get, don't, don't let people sleep and keep giving them, you start to get aversive responses. People don't want to do that anymore. You can make someone do your experiments. So the idea of the first experiment is to try to work, work around that. How? Well. Well, we will actually try to see two things in this experiment. The first one is to see if you define this. You keep, you keep the finds, you find the same things with uh, pre attentive processing. What is this pre attentive pro processing? Well, is the subconscious processing you do of the stimuli you receive. Should the, uh, first, starting with the transduction of this uh, of, uh, nature st stimuli, 
you start processing the uh, neural processing of the information. But it's do, it don't go out directly to a, con a conscious processing. This first part of the processing is called pre-attentive pre processing, uh, where you don't, give, don't have a direct access of the conscious portion of the cognitive uh, processing mechanism, and don't have access to that. Uh, it's not just a, a, I'm not just throwing something in the wall to see if it sticks. There's actually basis in the literature to believe that. L remember I talked before of ERPs, the event-related event -related potentials. Well, they, uh, there are few s studies with them which shows that uh, if you give someone a, in an auditory task a pattern, so like we saw before, and you break the pattern, a well, first time, we have an ERP. And this uh, ERP uh, happens pretty attentively. So you we have reasons to believe that the findings we had in the first experiments will keep uh, will find again, even if you pay, see the participants is paying attention to another thing. So we're going to test that, and by testing that we, we are allowed to another methodology we, uh, where the patients, the participants has more stimuli, so he got, don't get so tired, and can get a l more time of experiment from each participant. So the idea is to give a visual stimuli. Um, for now, I think uh, a mute mute, uh, one of the old ones without sound, like Chaplin, who don't have any more the, the copyright infringements, and put it with a visual center of attention, because in EEG, people can't keep looking and moving because the muscular contraction uh, interferes. So the idea is to give a move, so people get distracted and can watch a whole move. I think everybody here can watch modern times in one sitting. And to see if you can still find the, the, stru sorry? the structure of the tree in the, in the data, uh, but with a, a bigger sample, so to see if you get a stronger, a more robust finding. This is the first experiment. The second experiment uh, will, will look at the nature of the stimuli. Because we can just say, well, this is a mechanism that is fun, so it is used to everything in the brain. No, you can't just do that in science. You have to test it, test it and see how. So the, the, the idea is to test with another nature of stimuli. The, the, w I'm thinking to using a frequency. Instead of using, uh, because here we use the, uh, the variable is the uh, intensity of the sound. So high, low, and zero. Here, I the idea will to be different frequencies. So 220 fr uh, hertz, 440 hertz, 880 hertz. So I, will can I can't sing that, but it's you, can you can do that. With the same, with same trees, that's the, the really interesting part. You can do the same trees, just change the, the nature to find if you have uh, the same results. So this is the idea, the idea of the second experiment. And the third experiment is a little more ambitious and a little more down the road, the idea to do that. It's to do a concert with, uh, there were, I have people who do some concerts where people collect uh, neurological data. Uh, they do that in the Federal University of the ABC region, UFABC. We have, we are in contact with them and the idea is to, uh, there's a little problem with text there, sorry. The idea is to do with them a concert where people can watch the concert, so it also uh, works as a uh, extension program, so people can understand how science is made, and they have the pleasant opportunity to watch a beautiful concert, like you guys will have the opportunity in a few moments, and at the same time collect with someone. This is a nice idea because it's also have uh, the, the opportunity to go do a longer experiment because people can also sit through a long experiment, uh, the longer concerts. And uh, what's really interesting to me is because it got, got closer to a complex behavior of, the, of humans, the musical, the musical experience of hearing a concert and, and doing that. So you can test some, uh, this kind of uh, findings in a closer to a real, in a situation that's closer to a real situation you find in life. Um, so then one of the experiments, so how we do the experiment? One of the, the musicians will 
do the stochastic, will follow a stochastic source, and the other ones will play along. So if you believe, if you found if you already found that it is pre-attentive and it works in more than in more than one nature of stimuli, we expect you be also f able to find these results uh, after a, in a concert we're showing. Well, my time is ending, so is that, that's it. So just the abstract is that. Test this to the conjecture of the statistic brain, the brain as a statistician, no? yeah. I think it's better to say, and there are three experiments. The first one, the verified if processing is pre-attentive and the effect of the sample size. Uh, the second one tests the results with different natures of stimuli. And the third one, realization of musical concert presents a sequence generated by stochastic sources. Well, this is the idea. Thank you very much. <laughs> questions? Time for questions? Questions? No one? Thank you, Fernando. Very nice talk. Uh, on the first experiment, you I imagine that you are planning to compare the condition where you have uh, this uh, distractor uh, versus a condition where the person is fully attending, because you know. Yeah, uh, there's two ways I'm thinking of doing that. I didn't choose it for the first one. We we'll do with the uh, in two f in two parts. The first one with visual stimuli and without, and we will keep you being a shorter experiment. And if you find the pre-attentive uh, results, then do a second experiment. We'll do just the visual one, but longer. That's probably what we're gonna do. You can also just trust the, the bibliography and the literature and go ahead. But the, the, my plan is to do it in two parts. Um, um, I'm interested in the part you're changing parameters of these teams. You suggested that uh, changing the pitch could be a possibility. Yes. I think that here, M most important is not to change uh, the, s the quality of the stimulus, but, but to, to change the timing, so that you can introduce uh, jitters. And this should matter a lot. The noise here, in fact, should be thought in these terms, because you have a sequence of events. Now, the, you expect an exact timing for a certain event. What happens if you change a little bit this timing? Let's say introduce um, 100 milliseconds or 200 milliseconds jitters in the occurrence. Um, at the end, we have all this confounded in the experiment because you have a temporal expectancy, spatial expectancy, and uh, yeah, I, I agree. That's really interesting. Uh, really interesting question to do. I I. I I think both of the questions are in important to, to answer. I think this basic, uh, it seems really basic, but it's really important to test another stimuli nature. So I don't think we, we have to be careful to not generalize without testing this kind of result. So I think it's important to do what the test I do. But this is also an idea. These are the first three experiments of the my PhD, if everything goes right. So the idea is, uh, based on the findings, to keep growing and doing experiments like the one you're proposing. Uh, you have first of all see if the the results are how robust are the results, and based on that keep growing and building up, up upon the these experiments. But that yeah, it's a it's a really good idea. We I think we, especially when we mix with music like the third experiment, we can test this this kind of thing really in a really interesting uh, situations. Okay, I was just wondering. Um, if you're going to test only healthy individuals? Yes, uh, uh, at first, yes. We never know, depending on what you're gonna find. I, I read, I work with uh, the, the photo of the EEG that I have. It's a, it's a study that uh, helped, it's not, it wasn't mine, but it helped with uh, uh, clinical research with people with OCD. But uh, I'm, at, at first I'm looking for the, it's basic research, is is the, the nature of how it's working to, in second, uh, well, uh, the answer is, is, is interesting to, to work a lot, people with pathologies, but it's not my plan. But it's open to people who have the interest to get along and help with that.